All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We've all heard the expression, you must take a stand. In what does the child of God stand? Hello, my name is Cliff Goodwin and I'm thankful for your tuning in and being with me here today for another edition of Preaching the Gospel. Again, I ask the question, in what does the child of God stand? We find an answer to this question in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 12. In this verse the Bible reads, By Silvanus, we better know him as Silas, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God, wherein ye stand. Now as we read that from the King James Version of our English Bible, it, say, it reads to the effect, that the grace of God is that in which a child of God is standing. Other translations, however, word that last portion in the imperative. That is, this is the true grace of God, stand ye therein. Really, both of these senses are applicable to us as we strive to live the Christian life. The system of grace, for example, Christianity, founded upon the New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is a, sta a status or a system in which we stand. We take our stand therein. Thus, it is also very appropriate for us to be commanded, Stand ye in it. We must make a stand and it must be four square upon the Word of God. Today I want us to talk about standing in grace as we read there in 1 Peter 5 and verse 12. And as we do so, I hope that we can see why it is so essential. So essential that we rely solely on God's Word for every rule of faith and practice when it comes to spiritual matters because if we put our trust herein, we shall not be disappointed. Standing in grace will mean success for each of us as we faithfully carry out the will of the Lord upon this earth. Now, let's look to another passage before we get into the body of our discussion. Consider with me Ephesians 6 and verse 11. In Ephesians 6, 11, Paul told the Ephesians, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Here again we read about the figure of standing, only here we see it in adversity, in antagonism if you will, namely we are standing against something, against the wiles of the devil. Now really Ephesians 6 and verse 11 will serve to springboard us into our discussion. For you see the word translated wiles is from the same Greek word which also has produced our term method or methods in the plural. Here Paul is warning the Ephesians as he warns us today through the written word that our adversary the devil is very methodical. He has methods. He's very wily indeed in his assault of our faith. He comes against each one of us spiritually, each one who is striving to serve God. He does whatever he can to undermine our faith and to deter us from faithful service. Put on therefore the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
we're going to develop and approach this study from the standpoint or from the premise that standing in God's grace means that we are standing against the devil's methods. Let's consider some of these things together. Number one, standing in grace means that we are standing against deception. One of the major assaults that our adversary brings against us and against our lives and against our faith is through the avenue of deception. Our adversary is a liar. In John 8, in verse 44, Jesus said plainly to the Jews on that occasion, He said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. My, what a description of Satan. The father of lies. From the beginning he has been a murderer. How? Through the lies that he propagated. He lied to Mother Eve and she was deceived thereby. She and Adam partook of the forbidden fruit and thereby death entered into this world. Romans 5 and verse 12. The devil is a murderer. He is a murderous liar. Deception, no doubt, still today, must be one of his chief assaults, one of his most often used tools in attacking the children of God. I want you to open your Bible with me at home to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, I want us to read verse 4, and then we'll move down and note also verse 8. Colossians 2 and verse 4 reads, And this I say, Paul writes, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. That word beguile carries much the same idea as the word deceive. Paul says, I'm telling you these things. I'm warning you concerning certain things because I don't want someone to beguile you. I don't want someone to deceive you. See, ultimately we can trace back deception and lies all the way back to the devil himself, all the way back to our adversary. But under the devil, he has many servants, many people who are serving him in this world, whether knowingly or unwittingly, whether they are consciously serving the devil, realizing full well what they are doing, or perhaps they are mere pawns in this great game, this great struggle between good and evil and the devil is using them and they don't even realize it. They're unknowingly serving the devil, propagating and spreading his lies and they don't even know better themselves. Definitely there are so many enticing words as we read there in Colossians 2 and verse 4. Words that sound so pleasing, so attractive and maybe in some ways rather logical, rather reasonable in the ears of men. And yet upon closer examination and investigation, those words are not in harmony with the Word, the Bible, the inspired Word of God. We move down now to verse 8, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, which begins with the word, Beware. Beware lest any man spoil you. The idea likely is makes a spoil of you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Friends, do you see the two basic or primary choices with which humanity is faced? We either follow Christ, God, the Word of God, or we follow the traditions of men, the rudiments or the fleshly principles of this world. And if we do that, Paul warns us in Colossians 2 and verse 8, someone will make a spoil of you. You will be reduced to merchandise, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Folks, the servants of the devil, as they spread his lies and his deception, Oftentimes they simply look at people just like they were merchandise. 
They're not mindful of the souls of their hearers. No, not at all. They look at those hearers as simply a means to their own selfish end. The end of enriching themselves or any number of things. Gratifying their lusts. Folks, the fact of the matter is the devil spawns lies. Deception is one of the major assaults against which we must stand. Standing in the grace of God's Word will arm us against the deception, the lies of the devil. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and we can see this right out of the Scripture. 1 Peter 1 beginning at 22 and 23. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying what? In obeying the truth through the Spirit. Unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Notice there in verse 22, first of all, that these had purified their, their souls in obeying the truth. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word. Praying to the Father, the word of God is truth. We are born of that incorruptible seed, the word of God. Folks, the truth of God's word is the only sure and effective antidote, preventative even, to the deceptions and the lies of the devil. It's been well pointed out through the years that in the very beginning sin came into this world by man's hearing a lie, believing that lie, and obeying that lie. And true enough, that's what happened with Mother Eve and with Adam also. Eve especially heard the lie and believed it. And then both of them together obeyed that lie and sin entered into the world. But it has also been further pointed out that still today if man is to ever enjoy the remedy for that sin problem, he must in turn hear the truth, believe the truth, and obey the truth. As we read there in 1 Peter 1 and verse 22. And friends, there's some encouragement for every one of us in these principles. Yes, the devil is a liar. Yes, he makes assault against our lives and our faith day in and day out. Lies are told. False doctrines are propagated and spread. But we can be armed with truth. The truth of God's Word. And so we read in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 25... But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel was preached unto you. How do we stand in grace? You can only stand in grace by standing squarely upon God's word. This word endureth forever. This is the word by which the gospel is preached both far and wide. This right here is truth, soul-liberating, soul-saving truth. John 8 and verse 32, And thus it is the sure remedy, the sure antidote against deception. And one final passage along these lines. I think of 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister... Let him do it as of the ability that God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Speaking as the oracles of God there, first and foremost, probably touches upon the gravity and the solemnity that should accompany God's message. Anyone who is standing to represent or to preach the Word of God should do so as the prophets of old did it. And that is in gravity and in solemnity. It's not something to be taken lightly. It's not joke hour. It's not trivial and funny and novel. It's very serious. 
The message of God pertains to the souls of men. And as we preach, the souls of humanity still hang in the balance. And so we approach it in the proper manner. But you know, if we love the truth, and if we love the God behind that truth, then it should go without saying that not only will we approach it with the proper manner, but we will be careful to present the proper message. Be true to the book. Don't alter, change, or modify what is written herein. No. The devil already does that. The devil is the one in the business of deception. We need to present the pure truth of God's holy and inspired Word. But now number two. Another assault that Satan makes against our spiritual lives is that of seduction. Now, now get this and follow along and note the difference between these two methods. In deception, the devil distorts truth. In deception, he is able, if successful, to get people to transgress the law of God, probably because they did not know better. They were deceived. They believed a lie, perhaps thinking all the while that they were doing right. Well, the devil's not always able to pull that off. Some people know the Word of God too well. They study their Bibles, they meditate therein from day to day, and they recognize error and falsehood when they see it and when they hear it. For these, if deception is not successful, the devil can turn to the tool of seduction. Seduction is different because in seduction he also can be successful in causing man to transgress or break the will of God. But see, here in this case, Man does what he knows is wrong. He knew going in, he knew all the while that, that this sin or that sin would violate the holiness of God and the Word of God. So why does he do it? He's seduced. He's seduced through weakness. Jesus taught in Matthew 26 and verse 41, He said, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. And then Jesus added, The Spirit indeed is willing... But the flesh is weak. There are so many times in our lives when we know the truth and deep down inside we're willing to do the truth. We, we have a desire to live righteously and to perform the will of God. But you know what? We might be caught off guard sometimes. We might be allured through the lust of the flesh. We might be seduced. And in weakness, if we are not careful, we can falter and fail and commit sin against our God. John deals with this in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. The passage begins, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. See, those three avenues, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the things that we see and that appeal to us through that avenue, and the pride of life, the vain glory of life, that self-deception in which so many become entangled, in which they feel so self-sufficient. They feel like it's their way or no way at all. In those three areas, the devil can seduce us. He can seduce the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, causing us to do things that intellectually we know are wrong. We know that these things violate the Word of God, but we're weak. And if we're not careful as we read in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, take heed lest he fall. If we're not careful, we will be just that person. We will fall prey to the seduction of the devil. You know, there are some things that I would like to suggest to you that we need to remember. And in the moment of temptation, 
When the allure of sin is at its highest, remembering these three things will help. Number one, we need to remember that we serve a holy God. You know, the holiness of God is so great and so vast that with great difficulty, great difficulty, it needs to be impressed on the minds and on the hearts of men. It's really hard for us, in, pa- in fact, it's probably impossible for us to fully fathom the holiness of God. John said in 1 John 1 and verse 5 that He is light in whom is no darkness at all, not even a little pin speck as it were of darkness can be found in the character of Almighty God. We need to remember that. Remember the holiness of God. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 14, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We serve a holy God. And if we succumb, if we yield to temptation, committing a violation of God's Word, we have violated also His character. We have violated who God is. Remember you serve a holy God. Number two, not only that, remember the high cost of sin. Friends, sin comes at an extremely high cost, an infinitely high cost. In 1 Peter 2, 11, Peter would write, Dearly beloved, I beseech you, I plead with you as strangers and pilgrims that ye abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. What does that mean? That means there are deeds that can be committed in the flesh. There are things that we can do and say. There are ways that we can live in these fleshly bodies here on earth that will be to the detriment of our souls in eternity. Now that indeed is a high cost associated with sin. Remember that when the devil comes with his seduction. And then number three, we also need to remember the shame of our sinful past. Those of us who are children of God have been delivered from our sins. We've been forgiven. We've been made new creatures in Christ, given a new start. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 2, the Bible says that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Remember the the shame of your sinful past. And remember that you don't want to go back there anymore. But now as our time is quickly fleeting, there's a third approach, a third assault that the devil will make. When deception proves unsuccessful, When seduction fails to allure us away, he always has number three, intimidation. Simply put, if he can't lie to us and cause us to do wrong, if he can't appeal to our weaknesses and cause us to do wrong, he'll simply bully us into doing what is wrong. The devil is not at all above that, and thus we cannot yield to intimidation. In 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning at verse 8, we read, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions, see that's what Peter's dealing with, the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Satan was bringing persecution against these readers to whom the Apostle Peter wrote just as he was bringing persecutions and would bring even more persecutions against their brethren throughout the world. Intimidation. The devil is not at all against using that method, that tool. 
Staying in the book of 1 Peter, we can back up to chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we read beginning at verse 14 these words. But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, intimidation, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. In other words, Peter's saying, don't let them intimidate you, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers or criminals, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation or manner of life in Christ. Peter here was seeking to fortify his readers against the devil's method of intimidation, telling them you hold fast to your hope and you be ready to give a reason of that hope to those who ask of you. Let's all stand against the wiles of the devil. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been the good pleasure of GBN to bring you Preaching the Gospel with Brother Cliff Goodwin. If you have a question relative to what has been said, or if you would like to receive a tape or a cassette of the message itself, call the number that appears on your screen and give them the number of the message itself, and we will be happy to send it to you. We also have a Bible correspondence course, and this is free of charge. We'll send them to you one at a time as you need them. Study the Bible in the privacy of your own home. There is no greater privilege than to look into the Word of God. It describes me better than I know myself, and it points up the love of God and the means of my salvation. Friends, we would desire that you call and seek this further information. And now, back to Brother Cliff. In John 6 and verse 67, Jesus turned to His apostles and He asked this question, Will ye also go away? To which Peter replied in verse 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Today we discuss the assaults that the devil will make against us and against our faith, our faithful service even unto God. When he comes against us in our lives, whether through deception, seduction, or even intimidation, we need to remember where we can go. The only one who has the words of eternal life is God and His Son, Jesus Christ. May we ever retreat to the pages of the Bible and feast therein for our spiritual nourishment and guidance. Thank you.